As you know, we're here today to tell you about uh, the Senate budget targets and a budget we think that reflects uh, what Minnesota's priorities are. Uh, we think it ensures the state's uh, budget stability uh, going forward into the next uh, biennium. Uh, and you'll notice when you look at uh, the targets, we're spending uh, almost half of the money we're spending on education, on K-12 and higher ed. We think that is uh, a critical priority for us. Uh, when you look uh, in the tax area, uh, all of that target that you see is not tax relief. Uh, some of it is tax relief, including property tax. Uh, and some of it is, is restoring some of the accounting measures that were used in the 80s so that uh, we're able to make sure going forward uh, that, uh, that those kind of mechanisms are available to future uh, legislatures. Uh, it's going to spend less than the governor. It's going to cut taxes less than the House. And it's going to put $250 million into the budget reserve. It was the Senate last year that in the early tax bill insisted we put uh, additional money into the budget reserve. Uh, we're going to, we think that is, uh, very, very important. Uh, and on the budget surplus, I just want to say, uh, r remember it was it, the current binding we're in and the budget surplus we have today is made possible by the governor and the Democratic legislature that was in place the last two years. And the budget sur surplus specifically, when we adjourned last year and went home, we left $600 million unspent carried forward into this biennium. And now people call it a surplus, but what it is, it was a restraint in spending that has led to the good economic times and, and the revenue that we now have available to invest in the, the priorities that we all share. So uh, we're going to have that same kind of budget restraint uh, going into this session in our negotiations with uh, the governor and the House so that we ensure that the next group of leaders that are here uh, two years from now are in the same kind of position we're in today with a, with a state with a sound structural uh, budget that ensures stability for all of our state agencies and all the programming that the state provides. So uh, with that, uh, Senator, Senator Cohen chairs the finance divisions. Uh, you, you've heard from Tom on um, obviously the highlights. You've got questions about the particular aspects of this. I just want to comment for a couple of minutes. You know, I love history stories. Um, and I know we have a number of new folks in, in the uh, uh, Capitol Press Corps. I want to comment for a couple minutes on the budget reserve number. And uh, some of you will recall, and, and Tom made, made the reference, Rep. Senator Skoy and I had legislation two years ago to put uh, monies automatically after the November forecast into the budget reserve. But I want to take it back just a few years before that. You might recall that we had the uh, 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 Long Range Budget Trends Commission, and that was legislation uh, authored by Representative Ann Lincheski and myself, we weren't on the commission. Uh, it was co-chaired by former Republican representative and plenty commissioner Kevin Goodnow and former Perpich uh, Finance Commissioner uh, Jay Kodrowski. And their, one of their strongest recommendations was that the budget reserve ought to be at 5% of the general fund dollars. And that that was important for budget stability, it was important for economic stability, important for the credit rating of the state. Um, and if you read carefully uh, what the Council of Economic Advisors puts together or what they recommend uh, in the promulgation of the state budget forecast, and if you go through the entirety of the document presented by the management budget, you will find that over the last several years, and this is whether it's the Dayton Administration, MMB, or uh, the Plenty MMB office, there is always a strong recommendation that we build toward that 5% budget reserve. With this budget, we're not there yet. But this takes us to approximately 1.6 billion uh, versus that optimum 2 billion number. And uh, I would guess that if you look at states around the country, you'll find that uh, we are close to it in terms of building up a budget reserve that every national credit rating looks for, that anybody who, uh, any economist, whether conservative or liberal politically, uh, looks to relative to uh, uh, budget stability. So I, we think that's an important component. Um, and it, it follows what the Senate Democrats started to do two years ago with not just the three of us, but with the entirety of our caucus. And just wanted to offer some history on that and, and a reference relative to why we thought it was important to include more mo money to the budget reserve. Keep in mind that with the November forecast, some of that was automatically put into 
the forecast uh, through the into the reserve through the forecast. Uh, in this case, we do it on our own. Sure. Uh, just briefly, uh, I would like to take a little look back at where we are today in comparison to where we were. And really, when you look at uh, the state's economy and the unemployment rates, we're about back to where we were under the Ventura administration. I think that it's important for us to kind of look and see what was uh, done within spending and tax areas then and make sure that we are not repeating mistakes that were made. And so when we are looking at the tax budget for this year, if there truly are uh, one-time monies, we should use them for one-time expenses. Some of these accounting maneuvers uh, that we will be proposing are, are one-time expenditures, and therefore they're probably more appropriate than some of the ongoing uh, tax changes that uh, could be problematic into the future. But uh, with that, we're looking forward to uh, moving forward with a modest proposal that will include property tax relief as well as some of the repayments. You know, I, I shouldn't speak for Senator Scoy, but I think you can kind of assume that about half of that tax target is likely to be repaying some accounting measures that were done in the past. Uh, which puts our tax uh, relief number kind of pretty similar to where the governor's at, actually. Uh, you know, we're, we, we just think that's very, very important. And the Senate and, and, uh, has a strong role to play in these negotiations. Uh, some of you have heard me say uh, there are only 39 of us in the legislature, uh, in the entire legislature, that were here during the 90s when we cut taxes year after year after year that then we're here in the 2000s when we managed deficits for more than a decade. So I think the challenge uh, for those of us that have been around, especially for Senator Cohen in the Finance Committee and Senator Scoy in the Tax Committee, is to make sure we don't repeat some of the mistakes that were made and put the state's financial stability at risk going forward. Uh, everyone would like to spend more money. Everybody would like to have a tax cut. But really, the, 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 the state budget is critically important to the delivery of uh, all the services that our state and local governments provide and making sure that that stability is there going forward is just really, really critical. So I think, uh, you know, we're not in a position where the Senate's going to propose we're going to sit down with the House and, and kind of trade nickels back and forth based off of their targets. That's not what we're going to do. We're laying out a proposal here that says this is a budget that they should consider enacting into law. Uh, this is a, is a good final product. Now, to get them there, I think there's just a, a pretty significant educational process that's going to have to happen because uh, they just weren't here. They didn't live through uh, the times, and they don't understand, them, and, and I'm not speaking just to Republicans. There are a lot of Democrats and Republicans both that, that haven't lived through the risks that are posed with a surplus because the appetites get pretty strong uh, on the part of people of, with all kinds of things uh, that are important. And not to say that things aren't important, but you, you have to be careful that you don't overcommit. We've got a pretty, uh, pretty strong economy right now in Minnesota, and it won't hold indefinitely. I, I would argue that we're probably closer to the next recession than we are away from the last one. And uh, building up our budget reserves and, being, and having some discipline on spending is going to be very, very important that we're able to bridge that economic, that next economic downturn, which is certain to come. Uh, this, you know, the Senate has a very strong chair process, and uh, Senator Bonoff in higher ed and Senator Weger in, in K-12 with their committee members are going to make those decisions. Uh, but I will say, you know, it's a big number. It's, it's almost half of what we're spending. We're spending on education. So it's a very, very strong priority to us, uh, especially when you look at the higher ed number. I mean, when, when, when you look at the higher ed number, uh, if you had figured just normal inflation in higher ed, uh, we're over $100 million more in spending than what normal inflation would have been in the higher ed budget. We're very, very close in, in K-12, slightly less, a few million, of what if we had just put inflation into K-12 uh, going into the next biennium, we'd have been very close to the number we're at today. But we're making a huge commitment in higher ed, way over inflationary spending. Uh, and I, I, uh, I expect that Senator Bonoff is going to take very seriously the governor's proposal on putting uh, some additional money into the University of Minnesota Medical School. And I know Senator Stump has been working very, very closely with her uh, in the Minsk system to look at uh, a different way to deliver vocational technical education. 
So we're we're making huge commitments in uh, the education area of the state's budget. Do you think? I don't I don't think it's sustainable going down the road to think that Minsky and the University of Minnesota can come here every two years and put their hand up and say if you give us X we'll freeze tuition. That that is uh, that is uh, that kind of spending is not sustainable with an economy with about two to three percent GDP growth. So uh, for us to and, and we did a very good job the last two years in restraining uh, the growth in tuition by, by actually essentially buying a freeze. Uh, uh, I, I do hope that, uh, and I had dinner with the Chancellor uh, this week, we talked about this, uh, maybe we can't get a two-year freeze, but maybe we can get a one-year freeze. Uh, I, I've talked to uh, the President of the University about, well, you know, maybe we can't freeze tuition for everybody, uh, but maybe we can do it maybe for the undergraduate students. I think there's a, there's a hybrid proposal here where uh, we're still going to be able to provide some significant relief on what would have otherwise been and has been kind of runaway tuition. What is the government? My, uh, and I've talked to the speaker about this. I talked to him this week. Uh, I, I indicated to him that I really thought if we were going to have a good timely conclusion to the session, we needed to have everything in conference by the 1st of May. So the Senate will start moving budget bills to the floor uh, that week of the 17th of April, and our anticipation will be everything will be off the floor, ready to go to conference. Uh, before the end of April, and, and I think that is very, very important. I've expressed that to the speaker. Uh, we've got some significant differences in some of these areas, and it's going to take uh, some significant time for the conferees to figure that out. There is not debt service for a bonding bill in here, and, and I did not lock up money for a bonding bill because the speaker told me they're not planning on one. Uh, so uh, I can't pass a bonding bill the Speaker doesn't send me. The Constitution says it has to be a House file. So uh, he made it very clear to me in their budget targets they have no debt service for a bonding bill. So I didn't see a reason for the Senate uh, to put money away uh, for debt service in a bonding bill that the House wasn't going to send us. But I have uh, met with Senator Sump a couple times this week and told him to start preparing one. Uh, and uh, uh, we're meeting today at the Capital Preservation uh, meeting. and. We're going to learn today that there's about $30 million of new spending needs to be done to renovate the Capitol. Uh, when the original uh, bonding was done, it, it only considered uh, spending inside the footprint of the Capitol. And there's a lot of additional uh, uh, work that needs to be done to the stairs on the outside of the Capitol. They need to be taken off and weatherproofing put in. Aurora Avenue needs to be taken out uh, so that we can landscape the, the, the south side of the Capitol how we'd all like it to see. Uh, there's artwork that was not contemplated that needs to be restored in the original $272 million. So uh, that's one of the things uh, that I've asked uh, Senator Stump to consider. Uh, in, in the, Sen the Senate will have a bonding proposal ready if the House decides to send over uh, a, a House file on bonding.